Hey, take your, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua, chapter 3. And uh, while you're doing that, uh, brother, if you could help me with those chairs. While you're turning to Joshua, chapter 3, I, I just want to tell you, uh, in August of 1996, I married the most beautiful girl in the world and my dream girl. And I'm blessed to, to have an incredible anointed woman of God as my wife. And, you know, life has not always been easy. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? We go through ups and downs. And, uh, but I will tell you, when I've had tough, tough days and when I encounter problems, can I tell you that there are two loves that has really helped get me through uh, the first one is the love of God, but the second is the love of my wife. And when I have tough times, when I'm feeling down, when I'm discouraged, uh, her, her love helps me. There was a time that I was going, we were going through a situation, and I told her, I said, honey, I got to be honest with you, I don't have the faith for this. And she said, it's okay, I have faith for both of us. And uh, I'm grateful I'm grateful for an incredible, beautiful, wonderful wife that I told her on the platform during that two-minute, uh, you know, welcome attack where you're hugging on people and greeting people. I, uh, I looked at her, and I said something very spiritual to her. I said, it always helps standing next to a beautiful woman. There you go. All right? Guys, how many know what I'm talking about? And, and, and our love has grown more intense throughout the years, and, and I'm grateful for that love because when I go through problems in life, I can turn to the love that we share to really help me out of those, of those problems. All the married folk, if you understand what I'm talking about, just kind of wave at me. You understand what I'm talking about. And so I, I want to, I, I, because of that, I, I want to talk to you on this topic today worship and life's problems worship and life's problems webster's dictionary defines web or uh, worship as an intense love or admiration for something or someone listen to it again worship is an intense love or admiration for someone or something can i just can i just tell you right now that your worship is evidence of how much you love God. I'll just wait on you to catch up. You're slow, but you're worth waiting on this morning. Let me say that again. Your worship is the evidence of how much you love God. If worship is an intense love for someone, if worship is an intense love for God, then your worship shows how much you truly love love the father right watch this honey honey come help me just for a second she didn't know i was going to do this come watch this watch this i i love her and so when i when i see her throughout the day you know i wake up in the morning like you know a lot of times i don't think we ever go through the day without without doing this see isn't this awesome but you see i, I yeah, I'm kind of sweaty. Thank you, honey. You can, you can. You know what? It's, it's the intense love that causes me to do something with my arms and my hands. Oh, y'all ain't catching that yet. Let me say that again. You see, my, my, my hugging of her, what I do with this is evidence of how much I love her. And I can't show her that love. Y'all get ready. Tuck your toes up underneath. I, I'm going to give you a warning on this one. Right? I can't show her I love her like this. Don't, don't hate the messenger. I'm just the messenger. But the love of the Father is what will help you 
through life's problems. Worship will help you in life's problems. You see, I believe that you can have victory over life's problems. You can overcome. You can walk above. You can be more than a conqueror because of worship. It's, it's true. I'm evidence of it. I've been through enough to know that worship is key to getting out of life's problems and enduring the storms of life. Let me read in Joshua chapter 3. We're going we're gonna to read verse number 5. It says this, And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. See, what, what had happened is God had promised, God had given a promise to the children of Israel and they were about to step into the promise and there was just one thing that they had to overcome and that was the Jordan River. On the other side of the Jordan River was their promise. All they had to do was cross over the Jordan and they were able to step into the promise that God had for them. And so Joshua tells the people in verse number five, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Isn't it amazing that the wonders that the Lord was going to do didn't come until after they sanctified themselves? Can I just preach? Is that all right? Can I just preach today? It didn't come until after they sanctified themselves. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Look at verse number 15. And as they that bear the ark were coming to Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for the Jordan overfloweth all its banks all the time of harvest. And then verse number 17. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Look at, look at chapter number four. I, I want you to get this picture. They come to the Jordan. The Lord speaks to Joshua and says, tell the people to sanctify themselves for I'm going to do something wonderful and, and miraculous for them tomorrow. And as the priests that carried the Ark of the Covenant stepped into the, the, the waters of the Jordan, God rolled the waters back. And the Bible says that all of the people walked across on dry ground, just like the Red Sea under the leadership of Moses. Now under the leadership of Joshua, God rolled the waters of the Jordan back. This just this wasn't like uh, you know the Rio Grande in the middle of summer in some places where you can walk all walk across on dry ground very easily. This is at harvest time, so the river was was flooded. It was overflowing. It had overflowed. It's banks, and God rolled the, the waters back, not just where the river was, where the bed of the river was, but even over its banks, even the muddy, soggy areas, God rolled everything back, and they walked across on dry ground. And something amazing happened, and I'm going to, for sake of time, I'm not going to read all of the scripture, but in, in uh, chapter 4, God tells Joshua, I want you to choose 12 Men, one from every tribe. I want you to choose 12 men and I want you to have them take a stone out of the midst of the Jordan, carry it to the other side, and build a memorial there with those 12 stones. So that's what happened. Joshua chose 12 men, one from every tribe, to go into the middle of the Jordan and to find a stone, pick up that stone, carry it to the other side, and, and they built a memorial there. And that's what, and that's what these chairs are up here for, and, and this is going to be the Jordan for us today. And so they come over to the Jordan, uh, and they, they pick up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan, they carry it to the other side, and they build a memorial, and the Bible says says that this memorial is for future generations that when they see it and they ask, hey, what are these stones for? You can say those stones are a reminder of a reason to give God praise because the Jordan was keeping us from our promise, but God got rid of the obstacle. God got rid of the hindrance and God allowed us to cross and step into our promise. And so we took these stones and we built this memorial to remind you that you're in the promise simply because of what God did so we have a reason to give God praise 
I don't know about, about you, but for me, there, there were things uh, that I've gone through in my life where now that I, I, I can look back over the trouble that I had and I have a reason to give God praise because he brought me through. You see, here's, here's what happens. We, God has given us a promise and we're, we're having to walk through difficulties. We're having to walk through some things that's trying to keep us out of our promised land. And when we get to the other side of our trouble and God gets us and delivers us through the tough times, it's easy to look back over what God has brought us through and give Him praise. Right? How many have ever gone through a, 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 a real struggle, a tough time, a tough season in your life, and you were so thankful when you finally got to the other side of that, and you didn't have to live through that season anymore? Anybody in here that can testify this morning? You see, here's, here's, what, here's what God said. I want you to build a memorial. And so they built a memorial. And every time those stones were seen, it was a reminder of what God had brought them through. But here's something interesting that happened. God didn't say, walk through the problem, and when you get to the other side of the problem, find some stones and build a memorial that will be a reminder to praise me. God didn't. I asked the Lord, why? Why did you want them? Because for me, I'd be like, come on, Joshua. Why don't we got to carry these big old stones? Why can't we just get over there, find some, then we don't have to carry them as far. And the Lord told me, he said, it's not, it's not the, the praise that you give me when you get to the other side of the problem that matters. It's the praising me in the middle of the problem that's powerful, that moves me, that gets me to stand up off of my throne and reach my hand towards you and bring you through what you're going through. See, it's easy to praise him on this side of the problem after you've come through it. It's another thing to give him praise when you're smack dab in the middle of a storm and a problem and difficulties and you're broken hearted and you're going through a season of brokenness that's when the praise really matters and that's why God said take praise out of the midst of the problem and take it to the other side if you'll praise me in the middle I'll get you across to the other side you see, we have one of two choices when we go through storms in life. We can pander to our past and our present pain, or we can prepare our hearts to praise Him for the plans and the purposes and the promises that He has for us. The choice is, the choice is up to us. I can't tell you how many times I have walked into a church on a Sunday morning and knowing that I'm on the platform leading worship, yet worship didn't seem to be inside of me. It was one of those days that because of what I was going through, it hurt to lift my hands to worship. It wasn't easy to lift my hands and my voice to give him praise. And that's why the Bible calls it a sacrifice of praise. But can I tell you, resurrection doesn't come unless there's a sacrifice about half of you are getting it this morning but that's all right right these stones are a, are a reminder to praise God for what he's brought you through so whatever you're going through right now just begin to worship him just begin to praise him in the midst of the storm and God will get you to the other side how many ready to get to the other side amen Watch what verse number 19 of chapter 4 says. I think that's on, I think that's in the notes. Joshua 14, or chapter 4, verse 19 says this. On the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. Somebody say Gilgal. So they're walking through, they're walking through the wilderness under Joshua's command now. And the promised land is over there, and they come to the Jordan, and they have to get across the Jordan in order to get to the promised land. God does something miraculous, rolls the water back. They take 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan and come to the promised land, the promised side of the trouble, build a memorial as a reminder to give him praise for what he's done and what he brought them through. And the Bible says that on this side, on that night, they camped at a place called Gilgal. Gilgal in the Hebrew means wheel. 
It means rolling or to roll. It also means heap. Wheel, rolling, and heap. Not like, oh, that's a heap of junk. It, you know, somebody's car is like, oh, he, he drives a heap. You know, when he, right? In college, I drove a heap. Every time I turned it off, it would backfire. So when I was in a place where there's a lot of people, I'd turn it off and I would, I'd lay down, you know. And then I'd wait about two minutes before I got out of the car. Hopefully everybody had cleared, cleared out, right? That's not what this heap means. Uh, here's, here's the deal. What does a wheel do? What, what does a wheel do? It's, it turns. It turns. And when something rolls, it rolls. When it begins to roll, it moves away from the location that it used to be in. And then the word heap means, uh, simply, the word heap means a great number or large quantity. It means a lot. Somebody say a lot. Tell your neighbor, it means a lot. And so here's, here's what God, God tells Joshua. I want you to take 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan, and I want you to take them to the other side, Gilgal, the place of a wheel, the place of rolling, the place of a heap. In other words, here's what God is saying. God is saying, if you will praise me in the midst of your problem, I will turn your situation around. I will roll you and move you away from your current circumstances, and I won't do it in a little way. I'll do it in a great big way. Come on, if you know that God is able to do that, give you my hand clap of praise right now in this place. It's all because of your worship. Touch somebody and tell them it's all because of your worship. Now, here's, here, here's, a, here's a key thing in the story, the Ark of the Covenant. I, I want to take a moment and I want to talk about the, the Ark of the Covenant because it's significant. The priests were carrying the Ark, and when the priest's feet hit the water, that's when the waters roll back. Are y'all tracking with me today? Y'all with me right now? We all on the same page? The priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Can I show you this video about the Ark of the Covenant real quick? Watch this. I want to I want to talk to you just about the the ark for just a moment, and Brother Danny, could you help me? Brother Ty, could you help me too? Would you guys just come right here and and just stand and just face just face one another? And then, if you would, would you just lift your arms and, and do like this? There we go. Here's here's the ark of the covenant right here. There there are two cherubim on the top with their arm, and you saw the picture with their wings. 
they're facing each other and the wings are, they were hammered forward like this. And the Bible says that this right here is called the mercy seat, but it's also called, this is the place where the glory of God dwells. This is where the presence and the glory of God dwells dwells. Thank you guys so much. So here's, here's why I want you to see that. The, the Ark of the Covenant not just represents the presence of God, but it represents the glory of God. See, I need you to understand that you were created to worship. You were created to be a presence, not just a presence carrier, but a glory carrier. You were created to be a presence and a glory carrier. You were created to carry the presence of God and the glory of God with you no matter where you go. There's a story in 2 Samuel when David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And the Bible says that he made this really cool car. He got a brand new, bought a brand new Corvette to bring to bring the Ark of the Covenant back on right brand new cart and the bible says that when they got to the place of the threshing floor which i can't preach that but that's a great sermon that the the oxen that was pulling pulling that new cart stumbled and Uzzah reached up and they gra- and he grabbed hold of the cart in order to control the pre- oh my goodness in order to control the presence and the glory of god and the bible says that because he grabbed hold of it to steady it and to control it that the lord struck him down Can I just speak to you right now? Be careful trying to control the presence and the glory of God. You weren't meant to control it. You were just meant to carry it and let it do what it's supposed to do. You see, here's why why that happened. We always say, well, uh, that's uh, his fault. He should have never reached up and grabbed it. But can I tell you, it was also David's fault. Because David knew that the presence and the glory of God, the Ark of the Covenant was not meant to be carried on a cart. It was always meant to be carried carried on the backs of men you see you are meant to carry the presence and the glory of God with you everywhere you go when you go to work you should carry the glory of God when you go home you should carry the glory of God when you go out into the community to a ball game you should carry the glory of God and when you go to Walmart my Lord you need the glory of God and Walmart to deliver you from that place of Satan come on somebody You were created to carry the glory of God with you everywhere you go. 2 Samuel 6, 1 and 2 says this. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala and Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who was enthroned between the cherubim, on the ark. I've already showed you that, how God dwells between the cherubim. God is a midst dweller. God likes to be all up in the middle of stuff. Right? He, 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 where two or three are gathered in his name, he's in the middle of them. And here's the thing, cherubim are, are angels who were created to worship and to serve the Lord. In other words, the glory of God, uh, which, which here's the thing, the, the word glory means magnificent, astounding, manifested presence of God. Let me say that again. See, there's a difference between the presence of God and the glory of God. The glory of God means the magnificent, astounding, manifested presence of God. And that dwells in the middle or between the creatures of praise. I'm not talking about just the presence. I'm talking about the glory, the manifested, magnificent, astounding presence of God dwelt between the cherubim, creatures of praise. Can I just tell you that the glory of God dwells between the creatures of praise? That's why you need to be very strategic in where you sit in church. Okay, I, 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 you, you just got to you, you gotta believe the word of God or not believe it. But here's, 
here's what I know. Here's what I have figured out. That if I sit between uh, Johnny and Carl, and Carl is a worshiper, but Johnny is not, and I'm sitting in the middle of them, I'm not sitting in the glory, the manifested, astounding, magnificent presence of God. But if both Carl and Johnny are worshipers, and I'm standing in between them, guess where I'm standing? I'm standing in the magnificent, astounding, glory, presence of God. The manifested presence of God. Why? Because I was strategic in where I positioned myself. But wait, there's more. It gets better. If both Carl and Johnny are worshipers, I'm in the middle, I'm in the presence, I'm in the glory, the manifested presence of God. But if Sarah is sitting in front of me, and Candy is sitting behind me, and both Candy and Sarah are worshipers, guess what? I'm in a crossfire of the glory of the presence of God. That means it makes a difference where you sit in church. You ought to come in church. You ought to come in church like this. You ought to come in church and just, uh, excuse me, are you, are you a worshiper? Yeah. All right. Are you a worshiper? Yeah. Would you mind scooting over and just let me sit right? 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 Uh, I, listen, you. Okay. Can I, can I just say this and, and, and nobody throw anything at me? If you come into church, and let me say this to people online. First of all, y'all be in church. I can say that because you can't throw nothing at me through, you know, a video. All right? You you come to church and you and you find a seat and you're like oh we can see good we can see the screen good and we're not in the we're not in the wet section the spit section you know so we're safe we're in a good place right and then worship begins and you happen to look over and and the dude next to you is standing like this in worship you ought to look around and find out where the hands are lifted. And you say, excuse me, can, excuse me, let me, let me, let me reposition. All right? See, that's why, that's why it's important. Listen to me, leaders. That's why it's important to have true worshipers on the back row. Because you have true worshipers on the platform, at least you should. If not, make a change. It's not how in tune your voice is. It's how in tune your heart is. And then it's how in tune your voice is. Because we don't need nobody that can't carry a tune in a bucket. Right? There ain't no presence in that. You say, well, yeah, well, the Bible says make a joyful noise. The Bible also says that David appointed singers and musicians. I can't preach that, Right? But see, if you've got true worshipers on the back row and you've got true worshipers on the platform, then everybody sitting in between gets to sit in the glory of God, the manifested, astounding, magnificent presence of God. It's important where you sit in church. If your wife's not a worshiper, you better preach at home. From a distance. From the other side of the couch. Right? If your husband's not a worshiper, you better preach. Right? Come on. I'm, I'm making this light harder, but I'm preaching truth. Let me get, let me get back to this. So, so we've, we've talked about, about these stones here and how they, they represent praise. And it's easy to look back over the problem that God has brought you through and give him praise for what he's brought you through. God, I praise you for what you have delivered me from. But it's over here that really makes the difference. It's this chair that I really want to talk about. You see, Joshua went through the camp the night before the waters rolled back, right? And he said, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow God will do 
wonders among you. Did you know that the word sanctified means to be separated from sin and set apart to serve God? That's what sanctification means. Listen to me. It means to be separated from sin and set apart to serve God. Here's the problem with many Christians. They want the salvation, but they want the salvation without the sanctification. Because because the sin that I love so much that I've been wrapped up in for so long that has become a lifestyle and I enjoy it I don't want to have to give that up. I I want God to save me, but can he just save me and then me not be sanctified? Well, I'm getting into theology here, and I don't want to do that. But see, here's, here's the problem with a lot of people. We think that we can come and ask God to save us and to forgive us of all our sin. And when he forgives us, then we can go right back to talking the way that we were talking, acting the way we were acting, living the way that we were living, and doing everything that the world is doing, and being excited about everything that the world is doing, and not being, you know, not being affected by what the world is getting. And, and listen, can I just tell you, that's not true. That's not true. We, we lead people to the cross for salvation, but then we have to disciple them and let them know that, that, that we, we have to be sanctified. In other words, God's called us to be separated from the world. He's called us to be separate from, the, from sin. He has set us apart to serve him, and you can't serve him effectively when sin is in your life. I told you, I told you your worship is evidence of how much you love God. Your social media post is evidence of how sanctified you are. I, I, I've seen these posts. Uh, I'm a Christian, but I still cuss a little. Change is difficult to live with, but impossible to live without. All right? Come on, I, I'm not going to walk very far down that road, but you understand what I'm talking about. Joshua said, sanctify yourselves. Separate yourself from sin that's in your life. Because God has chosen you and called you to serve him. He hasn't just saved you to get you out of hell. He has saved you in order that you might be sanctified in order to lead others to the cross so that they can be discipled and sanctified so that they can go to heaven with you. God saved you to use you. He's got a plan and a purpose for you. And part of the process for you to step into the plan and the purpose is sanctification for you to change the way you were when you were living in the world. Because now that you're living with Jesus, we don't live the same anymore. Can I get to the good part? Here, here's the thing. The word sanctify means to become holy. The, Jesus said, be holy as I am holy. That tells you how we ought to live. Be holy for I am holy. Be holy like I am. I'm holy. Well, Jesus, you were perfect. We can't, we can't measure up. That's where the grace of God comes in, right? The grace of God doesn't lower the standard of living that God has for us, but it allows us to meet the standard of living even in our imperfection and even when we fail. So, so here's what it means. It means to become holy. It means to separate yourself from sin. But it also means to speak of God's holiness and to declare his holiness. When you speak of God's holiness and you declare your holiness, do you know what you're doing? You're worshiping the Lord. For you are holy. You are holy, Lord. 
holy, holy. To declare his holiness means to worship. So what was Joshua telling them? Joshua was telling them before the waters even rolled back, before the magnificent happened, Joshua said, get rid of your sin and worship. Get rid of your sin and worship. I want you to see what happened here. I want you to see the key of what happened here. When they got on the other side of the Jordan, they built that memorial as a reminder to give God praise for what he's done. But you see, it was the praise over here that really made the difference. Because without the praise over here, you can't walk through the glory of God. Uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me take you a little further. You see, this speaks of a lifestyle of worship. This speaks of, of not just worshiping God and putting on the mask in a show on Sunday morning when you come in so that people don't not, you know, people will sit by you because they think you're a worshiper. This speaks of worship is not what you do, it's who you are. Right? It's, a, it's not a, oh, Hey, here comes, here comes Bobby. It's a, oh, here comes that worshiper kind of thing. You're kind of walking, you're kind of walking along through life and, and just worship is who you are. That's just, that's just part of who you are. That's part of your nature is worshiping God. Even in the middle of the difficult times, you're worshiping God. Why is it so important for you to worship God in spirit and in truth every day? Because you never know when you're going to stand in front of an obstacle, when the enemy is going to throw something in your way, and you need the worship on this side of the problem that you run into. It might be Sunday, but Monday morning is coming. And how many know Monday mornings are, are, are not easy, right? And the first problem problem you run into on Monday morning is the alarm clock. Right? You never know when you're going to run into a difficult a difficulty when a storm is going to come. So we have to live a lifestyle of worship because here's what happens. If you're worshiping God and all of a sudden a problem comes, you've got worship on this side already covered. When you get to the other side of the problem, it's easy to turn around and say, I praise you, God, for what you brought me through. It's another thing to worship God in the midst of the problem, but the key to it all is before you even run into a problem, you're worshiping worshiping God you're praising God because if you're praising him and you're a worshiper and you're a praiser on this side of the problem and then you're a praiser and you're a worshiper on this side of a problem then you've got a creature of praise here and you've got a creature of praise there which means you're not walking through a problem brother it means that you're walking through the magnificent astounding manifested presence the glory of God I don't know who you are I don't know what you're all about this morning, but I hope you're about worship and praise because it's the key to walking through the glory and the manifested presence of God. They could literally see the presence of God. How do I know that? Because when they walk through, you got a wall of water here that they could see. You got a wall of water here that they could see. They could, even if they wanted to, they could literally, they could literally walk up to what the problem was, the Jordan. They could have walked up and said, I feel it. I feel the presence of, I see it. I feel it. It's real. And here's what I'm trying to tell you. When you live a lifestyle of worship and you're worshiping over here, and then when you get through the problem that comes your way, you worship him over here. Not only are you walking through the manifested presence, the glory of God, but you live in life on the mercy seat where you experience the mercy of God on a daily basis. 
You see, worship is so much more than singing and musical instruments. It's so much more. It cuts to the heart. As a matter of fact, if you need someone standing in front of you to lead you in worship, I would venture to say you don't really know how to worship. If you need music to help inspire you to lift your hands in worship, then maybe you're not deep enough into an intense love of God to really truly worship Him. I love the story in Genesis chapter 22 when God called Abraham to sacrifice Isaac and they get to the mountain and Abraham tells the, the two servants that he brought with him, he said, you, you stay here. Me and my son, we're going to go over there and worship. It's the first time worship is mentioned in the Bible. And yet there's no music anywhere around it. God didn't say, give me the keyboard player. Or Abraham didn't say, I need the keyboard player and the bass player. we got to have a drummer. Come on. Who can sing out to harmony? You. Okay, come on. Can anybody sing a tenor harmony? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Come on. No. He said, y'all stay here. It's just me and my son. We're going to go and worship. And music had nothing to do with it. It was all about sacrifice. And we walk in here. And we walk into church. And sometimes we act like, God ain't done anything for us to give us reason to forget about everything else around us and to lift our hands in worship. Can I just tell you something? God doesn't owe you anything, but you owe him everything. Well, lifting my hands is just not who I am. What if Jesus said lifting my hands is just not who I am? Well, being, being outspoken is just not who I am. What if God said speaking my word out loud is just not who I am? What a difference that would have made in our lives and how different our lives would be right now. I'm trying to get you to understand the importance of worship. I'm trying to get you to understand the importance of when you come in here on a Sunday morning or when you wake up on Monday morning or on Thursday afternoon, the importance of making sure you live in the presence of God by being the presence and the glory carrier that God created you to be. And there's no better way to do that than to be a worshiper. Would you stand in this place with me this morning?